Excellent. Have that going. Open up the Zoom folder to grab the recordings. Switch this over to this Discord CIS seventy five. Okay. We'll just wait the uh, two minutes and then we'll start two fifteen. Okay, well, two fifteen. Let's get started. All right, welcome to module number seven. We are almost halfway across the semester. This picture, I actually think it's a good idea. The whatever pin number you need to enter will stay mostly secure because the numbers will change every single time somebody comes up. I think this is great. If somebody is shoulder surfing you and you enter your pin to get in, the next person tries to get in, they'll have a different combination, so it won't be the same. I actually think this is a good idea. This chapter is still talking about networking, but more along the lines of the protocols. As a quick reminder, cybersecurity professionals should be well acquainted and knowledgeable in the OSI and the TCP IP models. These models provide the means to quickly assess problems and resolve them in a timely manner. Your networking skills are definitely required in this field. Now, you don't have to be a CCNA uh, in order to get into security. You just have to remember how things work. SNMP. The simple, net man the simple Network Management Protocol provides remote management to network devices like routers and switches and others from one location. SNMP devices have targets that listen for commands and execute them. The problem with this is if there is an attacker in the network, they can listen for these if they're not encrypted and be able to 
take control and send malicious commands and just drive chaos into the network. Version number three is recommended, but you know, most places don't enforce the latest versions of things. So if you get into a business and they have SNMP, but it's like version one, or it's just public private, um, the, the two community strings, then it's very easy for an attacker to figure that out and be able to cause chaos on the network. DNS, the lifeblood of the internet. It's an essential protocol. It was built without security in mind, and yet we depend on it, like, like electricity, to power our computers. Here is a process of uh, how DNS works. Since it is an essential service, DNS usually is a target for attackers. In order to prevent things like DNS poisoning and zone transfers from succeeding, DNSSEC was introduced as a defensive layer adding asymmetric cryptography, digital signatures, along with extra resource records to validate those responses. Now, again, it doesn't mean that it's being used everywhere. Uh, a lot of the modern tools and routers and whatnot can use DNSSEC if it's enabled, if it's set up, but DNS in itself is a completely unencrypted and vulnerable service that is always a target for attackers. Because if they can poison the, um, the DNS cache, they can have an entire network go to the wrong sites, go to the ones that they want, any spoof sites, and get information or download uh, malware and just take off. DNS is a very prized service. There's FTP, another important protocol for file transfer that was also built without security in mind. There are two iterations, FTP secure or FTPS and secure FTP with the S in the front of FTP. While this may seem confusing, FTPS utilizes the same ports and unencrypted FTP, sending control commands with SSL or TLS on port 21 and data unencrypted on port 22. SFTP uses a different port with encryption and compression built in. So if you want to secure file transfer, you really want to go with SFTP and not FTPS. POP3 and IMAP, the two email, the two main email protocols carry the same characteristics as above. Both were built without security in mind. Both communicate their information in plain text over the internet. Although SMIME is seen as a solution, it does have some limitations. For example, SMIME cannot be used when mail is accessed via a web browser and any encrypted messages become difficult to decrypt by a third party tool that inspects the mail. Enterprises ensure mail security by installing gateway appliances that automatically encrypt and decrypt messages from within their organization. It does lend the conversation of what, the, what privacy exists on a company network. If they're going to install a mail gateway that will automatically decrypt and encrypt mail that comes in and out, 
But just as a reminder that these protocols that I'm just listing are built to be unencrypted, built to be essential, and, um, and we have to defend. We have to protect, we have to monitor knowing that they were built insecurely and we have to figure out ways to make them secure. Here are two security devices. The first one, this crypto accelerator, is, a, is one of many SSL or TLS accelerators. They are a separate hardware cards on things like web servers that handle everything that's cryptography, that handles like the certificates, that handles the decryption and encryption of data. They can be installed alongside uh, proxies as well. In this way, the CPU doesn't have to do the decryption encryption, it's handled off on another, on another chip. That will help speed up communications, that will help to speed up load balancing uh, if you have other devices to handle cryptography and you know, so one processor does the crypto, another one does the actual web serving. Um, that, that is beneficial. The other one, this shark tap, is a test access port. These are great to see what a client is experiencing. This physical tool paired with, with a Wireshark will allow you to view the packets that are passing through without any performance degradation to the devices it is intercepting. I really like the shark tap. I understand that, that uh, the model that I use is almost $300, but let me tell you, it does the job and it does the job well. I recommend it, but I understand that it is $300 and I did only buy one because it is $300, uh, but it is a good tool to have in your arsenal. Other tools that you could have in your arsenal that uh, can be either free or you know, with, uh, with things like Azure or Google or AWS, uh, you can get things like uh, sensors, collectors, and filters that you can place around the network to see uh, where the data stream is largest to view, gather, or block data. You can use correlation engines like seams to aggregate data from different sources to uncover things like an attack or a breach or just suspicious activity. You could get aggregator switches like load balancers that should be placed at the edge of the network that can take multiple network connections into a single link. Uh, you should also be using things like DDoS mitigators, whether that's things like Cloudflare or actually having a physical device that'll handle real-time DDoS attacks, which are great if you know what's happening on your network. We need, as security folks, we need to know what's happening on our network. We need, to, we need to be able to gather data, as much data as possible from our software and our hardware tools to get a clear enough picture of our network. Information such as IP addresses that are rejected and dropped, probes to ports that have no services running, source routed packets, suspicious outbound, unsuccessful logons, or just the tip of the iceberg of things that we need to have tools help us see. DLP, which we talked about last week for a bit, that could be part of the list, letting us know if a file is getting exfiltrated by a user. But these are no good if we Number one, if we don't pay attention to them, but number two, also put them in a way that they will tell us what's happening and we can quickly understand when something suspicious is happening versus life is normal. 
So you have a lot of tools at your arsenal. The real question is, what are you trying to protect and how will you do that? For example, getting logs together from various devices is a great idea, but what are you gonna do with all that? How are you gonna process it? How are you going to take out the false positives from the true positives? Um, you know, how, how will you stay vigilant? Because one of the problems that we get is fatigue. With so many sensors, so many things happening, we start ignoring reports. We start ignoring those emails that are being sent from our tools and we become complacent and then problems happen. And you don't want that. You don't want to do that. You want to be able to stay vigilant, be able to always get relevant information that you can act quickly upon and not get overwhelmed from all these tools while being able to get as a, a big enough picture of your network to know what's happening. A wonderful balance. Funny enough, the, uh, the book takes kind of a left turn and starts talking about virtualization at this point, which I kind of find funny because we've been doing virtualization right from the get-go. But virtualization is not going anywhere, as you have seen. It's helped greatly with uh, classes like this or in the real world, helping businesses stay afloat during the pandemic, helping to manage, orchestrate, and utilize all the resources that devices can provide. If you didn't know, uh, there, are there are two main types of hypervisors, types one and two. Um, the, the type ones run a hypervisor operating system but directly on the hardware, kind of like VMware's ESXi. The type twos will run something on top of another operating system, so such as VMware, VirtualBox, Parallels, that kind of stuff. That, those would be type twos. There are also containers, which you should be familiar with, like uh, Docker and Kubernetes. These will use small snippets of a system to do a task. Containers are built small enough so that they only do one thing. They're not meant to be full on computers. They're not meant to be full on virtual machines. They are this, this little weird spin off uh, they have some resources, some autonomy, but not really. In the cloud, as you have been doing projects and, and uh, work in the cloud, you are using uh, software-defined networks. The, the packets that you get from let's say when you connect to your Windows box or your Linux box in GCP, the majority of that route, it's all software packets. They're not real. They're not real packets that you would normally see on a wire because it's all software based. At some point, it does go into a physical switch, into a physical router out through the internet and, and to you. But there is a good portion of that journey where the packet is really nothing more than data in a file moving from one machine to another. So understanding the basics of SDN, Software Defined Networks. For example, the data plane, which functions as a network device and connects the physical network. The control plane that handles routing and traffic control between applications who are sending or requesting data. And the application plane where we have the, the whatever program is running, whether that's like Excel, whether that's RDP, whether that's you know, whatever it is. Understanding that that traffic nowadays runs in software defined networks. It, it is not a real packet. It's a simulated packet until it gets into the into the NIC 
and then comes out a regular packet as we know them. That, that brings a whole nother realm of security because it could be possible to leverage the software to give up other packets that are traversing through it. Like for example, in a type one hypervisor, it can be possible to get into the RAM and be able to see what's happening in RAM. And that's where a lot of those, those software defined networks are happening. That's where a lot of the packets could be passing by. So it is, it is possible for an attacker to take over a type one hypervisor, be able to read things like RAM or a swap space and be able to see what's happening on the network, be able to take information on the fly as it's going through and do all kinds of malicious stuff with it. That's all on us to detect and protect. Have I scared you yet? Not yet. Excellent. Come on, Zoo. There you go. Where is there we go? Get about a minute, it'll be ready. Seventy nine percent. Excellent. Now the work of the week. This week, you will begin Splunk Fundamentals 1. Now I know it says one and two, but this is how I, this is one way that I'm gonna check to see who's paying attention and who isn't. As of right now, you can do Splunk Fundamentals 1. I am working with, uh, with Splunk to get Fundamentals 2. But for now, you should only be able to do Fundamentals 1 right from their site. If you just Google Splunk Fundamentals 1, you can sign up and do Splunk Fundamentals 1. That is the requirement. So this link that goes to Work Plus still works, but um, you can't log in. And I'm working with Splunk on that. So again, your assignment is to complete Splunk Fundamentals 1. Not 2, just 1. As an added bonus, I have added the links for you to learn how to deploy PyHole. PyHole is a great tool that's free that you can use as your DNS server that'll help you things uh, that'll help you do things like block out ads the majority of ads and you can leverage to do things like whitelisting and blacklisting domains um, as you find more. A tool like PyHole is great because it, it can run on a Raspberry Pi. So it's a very low power system, but it's strong enough that it can provide a layer of security to your network. Like for example, it can do DNSSEC it can forward requests to more secure servers like quad 9, uh, 9.9.9.9. .9 if you are weary of using Google as your, your DNS or Cloudflare, you could use this. I use this. I use quad 9 instead. So you can set up a pie hole if you want. It is not a requirement. It is a great tool. Uh, I think as security folks, you should be able to try different stuff. So if you have a Raspberry Pi lying around, 
you can set it up as a pie hole and set quad nine as your, your DNS and see, see the difference. Try it out. But again, the goal of the week is to complete Splunk Fundamentals 1. And what you would be submitting is the PDF that, with the certificate that says you completed Splunk 1. Any questions? Oh, and as always, NetLab is, is extra. If we took the Splunk 1 course for CIS 194, are we supposed to do it over again? No way. Okay. Uh, hopefully, you still have that certificate. So, yes, I believe I do. <laughs> so then just slap it in there, and, and you are done, my friend. All right. Sounds good. Why, there is no way I would make you suffer redoing that if you've already done it before. That's just, that that's just mean. Prime time for me to be able to catch on some uh, assignments, some bad that kind of uh, falling behind on. So exactly, use your time wisely. So yes, if you have done Splunk Fundamentals one in any of my other classes, just put the PDF in there and you'll be done. Then move on to if you're falling behind, use the week to catch up. If you are all caught up, I mean, feel free to to take five or jump to the next module. That's all. That's all up to you. Sweet that I am done for the week. Good. If you're behind on anything, catch up. Otherwise, there you go. Great question. But yeah, yeah. If you have already, if you've completed it, no need to redo it. Just, just send the PDF again, and that'll that'll check off the box. Are there any other questions? So the only question I have is um, I have no experience with the Raspberry Pi. And I'm actually considered buying one just to kind of mess around with it. Uh, is there, do you have any suggestions on something I should start off with just as for beginners, I guess? Um. Uh, let's see, kit. There are different kinds and so here's the different different models. Uh, you could use it as a a little computer. It's not super okay. powerful, but definitely does the job. Um, I have this one running mm -hmm. at my pie hole and a bunch of other things at once. Okay. Um, it starts at 35 bucks. You have different RAM choices. You can pick this up pretty much anywhere, like Best Buy or I think even Target. Oh, Some really? Things. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, it doesn't. Out. It doesn't need video. Mm -hmm. You could uh, run. Uh, SSH, okay, and be able to connect to it, mm -hmm. and if you want, but you don't have to. It does need a micro SD card, and that serves as its hard drive. Okay. Uh, the Pi Four is USB C powered. Oh, the Pi nice. Three and down are the micro USB. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the first one that comes with USB Three. Oh wow! Okay. So again, that if that matters to you. Oh. Um, and honestly, using using something like like this one, mm -hmm. you could you could install a Pi Hole on it and and use it as that. Okay, I'll, that, I'll that would be a very easy way to start. It is yeah, not I'll hard definitely. at all to install Pi Hole on an SD card and then just uh, add it in there and and boot to the thing, and the process is a piece of cake. Okay, perfect, and uh, I appreciate the uh, suggestion now. I'll look into getting one so I can kind of mess around with. I know we use them at work because I work for a surveillance company where we do our we set up our own uh, uh, cameras into our own servers and, and and stuff like that. So I know that a lot of the stuff, so it's not saved on the actual server, uh, gets saved onto the Raspberry Pi. But I've never actually really sat down and and, and messed around with them 
of one. I, I actually just do the setup of the servers and stuff like that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just think of this as a very tiny computer. Got it, got it. That's, well, that's really what it, it is. A nice tiny computer that can do a lot of things, but it's not, um, you know, it, you can't like play Steam games on it yet. You know, right, right. It's not that powerful. But <laughs> no, no, I get it, I get it. But okay. it's powerful enough to do to do quite a lot. Got it. Yeah, from from what I'm able to see, yeah, it it, it can be used for multiple platforms, do multiple things. So yeah, awesome. I, I appreciate the time to explain of explaining that and, and walking me through the site. Yeah, no problem. And if if uh, you know you start working on it, you get stuck, just feel free to ask questions in in Discord, and I'm sure there's. There's folks like myself and others who've played with them and we'll, we'll help you out. Okay, awesome, very much appreciated. Other questions, other ideas before I hit uh, the stop recording?